Grace, mercy, and peace to you all in the name of God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Can you join me in a word of prayer? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you pour out to us in it. And Lord, the gifts of, of song, of being together. Uh, the gifts, Lord, of, of you and your power, your authority, your rule over us. Lord, we ask today to help us to listen, help us to listen to what you did in Luke 7 and, and throughout these Gospels, uh, to see that you are God for us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The reading for today is this really kind of dense uh, gospel. A lot of times when we get these readings, these, these moments, these snippets of gospel, uh, when, when we're telling the story of Jesus, we're telling, here's this little story, here's this little story, and you get like 10 verses, and a lot of stuff happens in 10 verses. And a lot of stuff gets left out of 10 verses. Right? A lot of stuff is assumed that, that people know about what was happening here or, or what's happening here. But you have this whole story about uh, a guy who was sick. Right? That, that's actually, there's, well, let's just go back a bit. This story takes place in a, a town called Capernaum. And you may be familiar with the town of Capernaum. Capernaum is the home of Andrew and Peter and James and John. It's, it's situated kind of on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. So if you have a map of Israel thinking in your head, there's Galilee, there's a little lake right there. And on the northwest shore of that is this little town of Galilee. Or a little town of Capernaum. A uh, little town of Capernaum up there. And lots of things take place in the town of Capernaum. Lots of things. Uh, they, they, they go to Capernaum. Jesus heals Peter's mother. There's, there's all sorts of things, her mother-in-law, all sorts of things that actually happen in the town of Capernaum. But this particular story takes place with a centurion in the town of Capernaum, or a centurion somewhere near the town of Capernaum. And this, this guy, a centurion, is a Roman soldier who's in charge of 100 troops. That's why they're called centurions, because that's 100 centurion, right? We're good. That's good. Century 100. We got that in English. Good. Uh, and you have this centurion, and he's, uh, he's, he's has a servant who's sick. And apparently this servant is somebody that he highly values, and he says, I, I don't want my servant who is very, very sick to die. I want my servant to be cared for. I want my servant to live. Right? So in the background of, of this whole story, there's this person that you would never actually meet in the story. You have him, he's sick, he's, he's back there. So you have the centurion, he's a servant, uh, and a servant. You actually don't even meet the centurion in the story. What you do meet instead is a bunch of people who go and seem to kind of act as these, these go-betweens. And one of the other things that, that gets brought up in this story is that this centurion is actually a nice centurion. Uh, as opposed to other Roman centurions, this one's actually nice. He, he cares for the people, he takes care of them, he's built their synagogue even. He's done good work. And so, Jesus, you should pay attention to this guy. You should do what he asks because this guy's done good, which is a very un-Lutheran thing to ask, right? Your good works should have nothing to do with your salvation of any sort, right? And so when we might approach this text, when, I think when we approach uh, a lot of biblical texts, we can kind of ask one question. One question is always helpful to ask whenever you're reading a Bible passage. Why? Why? <laughs> why? Why this? Why does Jesus do this healing? Does he do it because the centurion did good work? Does he do it uh, because the, the centurion is a, a friendly Roman in a uh, land in a country where there's a lot of non-friendly Romans? Why does Jesus do this? We're going to look at the answer in just a little bit, but it's, it's one of those things, why does Jesus choose to do this one when there are lots of people who are sick, when there are lots of people who are, are, are not doing well? Why does Jesus choose this? He does it because he, I believe, wants to teach us a lesson from this, and so that's why we have this recorded, these ten passages recorded. The, the second why is, why is this man's faith commended to us? Right? This isn't a, a passage that, that necessarily talks about Jesus on the cross or, 
or Jesus uh, giving up his life for anything. In, in fact, it really does seem like the person who, who has the most importance within this story is the centurion. His faith is what is commended. He brings fans to the people. Admasu um, is going to be a centurion at some point. Right? Why is this man's faith? He, he doesn't even profess that Jesus is God. Right? This, this guy, he doesn't do that. It, it, most of his conversation, most of the things that he talks about is actually about soldiering. Why is this man's faith commended? See, here's the thing with the centurion. The centurion does one thing that I, I believe is, is the most important thing for you or for me or for anybody ever in the course of, of our history. The centurion recognizes Jesus as a Lord. The centurion recognizes Jesus as a Lord. The recognition of authority is, is hugely important. Who is an authority in your life? Do you have authorities in your life? Are you like most Americans where you are the authority in your life? The centurion recognizes the authority of Jesus, his position, his power, and he approaches him in, a, in the proper way that you would approach somebody who has an authority over you. Right? This guy, see, here's the thing with the centurion. He knows what it is to have authority. He knows. That's his conversation. That's, you know, I say, I say go, and this guy better go. I say go, but this guy better get his butt over here. He knows what authority is. And he looks in, in this moment, in this situation, and he says, I am not the authority. And I can't be the authority. The kind of looming behind all of this thing is, here is a servant, and it, really it's not a servant. Remember in the, in the ancient Near East, in the Old Testament, and in, in, to the New Testament, they don't have servants. They don't have butlers. This is not Mr. Bates. This is, you know, this is a slave. Right? This is, this is not, you know, some, they've agreed to some sort of voluntary agreement. This is somebody that he owns. But he still values him. And, and so here you have, you have this century and approach Jesus in the proper way. The proper way is simply this. It is without pride. Without pride. And I want to I just highlight that because for the next few weeks we're going to be talking about faith. And we're going to uh, talk about here are some of the obstacles that exist for us in faith. And if there is no greater obstacle, there is no greater obstacle to us in our faith than our pride. You with me? There is no greater obstacle to us in our faith than our pride. It's just the way it is. Here's how this, here's how this works in us. We live in a way that is self-sufficient. We, we are capable, we are able, especially here in our current society, to maintain our lives, or at least to maintain the veneer of our lives. If I want air moving around, I just have to think it. This is amazing. We, we, are, we are often self-sufficient in the way in which we go about it. All the time I get people who, who say to me, you know, like, I, I can do it myself. I've been doing it. I, I can carry this on. I can carry whatever it is on, on all by myself. We are, we are self-sufficient people. We are self-important people. Because that's another aspect of pride. The centurion could do this. Maybe you've done this with God. The centurion could say, look, I am a centurion. I have a hundred soldiers. Jesus, I am now sending my soldiers over to you. I am dragging you over here to come heal my servant. Sometimes we approach God with our own sense of self-importance. 
God, do this now. I'm the one who's in charge, God. I say, come, you better get over here. We live in a way that is self-exalting. Pride leads to self-exaltation. To putting and cheering ourselves on. Even our, 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 our weakness, our, our, our faults are often couched within terms of, look at how much I do. Here's how that works in us. Pride moves us to the center. Pride moves us to the center of the world. So God, if he's there, he's at best at the periphery. And so this centurion, this story of the centurion, the centurion who gets commended by Jesus for his great faith. He says, I haven't found this great faith in all of Israel. Why? Because the centurion said, I can't be in the middle anymore. I am not capable of healing. I am not, I am not the most important. I am not the one of, of absolute greatness. I am instead somebody who is in, in need. And he recognizes his position. He recognizes his own power. And he says, I need something else. See, one of the things about pride, or probably the thing about pride, the, the defining statement about pride, is that pride is against faith. And when we suffer through our, our pride, or we suffer through the pride of others, uh, because really it's never my pride problem, it's always yours, <laughs> right? That's, that's how the way pride works. Hey, when we suffer through this pride of pride leads to every other, other vice that exists in this world, because we've, we've moved ourselves to the center. We, we say, my needs, my wants, my demands, my whatever is the most important. And this centurion, in this story, he's willing to drop everything for a slave. He's willing to drop all power, all pretense, all, all of his own glory for the sake of his slave. That's why I think this story is sitting here and, and, and why Jesus commends this man for his faith. He says, you are willing to reach outside of yourself for the sake of someone else and you're willing to come before the, 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 the only person within this cosmos, this whole of, of reality, who is able to make that change, that difference. When we have our pride, we will never approach Jesus as if he is the master of the universe, as if he is the one who is exalted, as if he is the one who, who is, is to be honored and glorified and, and praised. We will only approach him as the one to do our bidding, the one who, who we should control. I invite you with this centurion to become a beggar. To realize you're not that important. That, that you're not that powerful on your own. How many of you believe that you can do everything? How many of you are finding that it is almost impossible to do everything? Yeah. And yet you still try. <laughs> I know you. I am you sometimes, most of the time. Pride is sneaky. So with this center of and say, Lord, only you. Only you. And that, that is a great faith. That's a faith that Jesus commands. Lord, only you. And in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Lord God, uh, be with us. And bless us as, as we seek to see our pride. Lord, maybe we need to have you come and reveal what that pride is in us. And Lord, in whatever way that that happens, we'd ask that, that we die to that pride so that we may call on you. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.